Okay, um, we did that troubleshooting lecture on this washer and I really wasn't happy with the quality of that camera that did the display. It was a little blurry and hard to read and I really not happy with the, with the visual recording. The, the material was good, but not the recording. So <clears throat> I'm gonna hold off on, on that troubleshooting on those washers until we get, I get a camera that's gonna do a better job. But uh, I, lately, the past couple of days, I've had a lot of technicians calling me, asking me about troubleshooting electrical circuits. And they're having problems trying to find what's wrong in the machine. They've changed parts, the machine's still not working, still doing things. So we're gonna go over two diagrams and two machines today, starting off with this dryer. And I'll give you guys the problem and then what we're going to do is we're going to discuss, okay, if we had this problem, what is, what is our procedure for testing it? And then I'll, I'll tell you how I helped them troubleshoot it over the phone and find out what the issue was with those machines. And you'll be surprised that these people changed all these parts and wait till you find out what was wrong with these machines. So I started off with a GE dryer. I don't have the full model DPSR but I'll put the service manual and the diagram on my drive and put links on my drive to those technical diagrams that I got and you guys can download them from that drive, okay? So um, here's the GE dryer. The complaint that the customer says is that the dryer will not start, okay? Now, one thing about GE, and I will say this, you see this switch right there called an idler spring. What, it, what is that switch? Is it that the spring that's on the boat? That's correct. It's, it's a pulley that keeps tension on the belt so that when the motor's turning the drum and you got a lot of wet clothes in there, that pulley adds a little bit of tension to the belt so the drum can rotate, okay? If that is bad, you see that's in series with the motor. But when you press start, the motor should get power. The only problem, if that switch is bad, you go to GE dryer and you hit the start switch, the motor runs. But when you let go of the start switch, the motor dies. Mm -hmm. And usually it's indication that either the belt is broken or possibly that idler spring switch is bad. That's usually one of the two things that's wrong, okay? But this is not the problem. This problem is the dryer is not running at all. So the first thing is, on a dryer, how much, how much voltage do we have on a dryer? 240. 240. 240. We have line one, neutral, and line two. So line one to neutral is 120. Line two to neutral is 120. Line one to line two is 240. Okay, so if the motor's not running, what are we concerned with? 120, 240, what, what, what are we concerned? 120. Just 120. Yeah. Because the motor here runs off 120. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you the circuit for the motor. Power comes in here, goes through this component, and it's waiting for you to hit the start switch. When you press the start button, the power is going to go through the motor. And when it goes through the motor, the motor has two windings inside, a run winding and a start winding. We only use the run winding when the motor's going. That's what this switch is right here. It's once the motor's going, that switch disconnects. If we don't disconnect it, we damage the motor. But we need both of them to start the motor because when the clothes are wet and heavy, it's very hard to get the motor going. So then the power comes out and goes through here and through here. Now the overload protector is inside the motor. It's not like the motor and then you have this separate switch someplace else in the machine, all right? So that's the circuit that we are concerned with. So when you're going up to the machine and you have something wrong with the machine, one of the things you want to do is identify the load that is not working. Now the whole machine's dead, but what's the first thing a dryer does when you press start? The motor runs. We'll worry about if the motor runs and it doesn't heat, 
then we'll worry about the heating element. But we're more concerned about why isn't the motor running because that's, that's the main part of the machine. So what would be the first test we would make in this case if we were checking this machine now? Check the power. Check power. Yeah. And where would you check the power? At the um, outlet. At the, At the outlet, correct. Um, let me grab a cord real quick. I want to show something. Yeah. So this is a three wire power cord for a dryer, okay? A stove power cord looks very similar. The difference is this center piece right here. If you see this is, is bent at a 90 degree angle, I tell people it's like the letter L and think of L for laundry and that's how you would know this is for the dryer. The stove, the center one is, is straight or flat. The difference of those two is the cables look similar, but if you look closely, you'll see that the dryer cable is smaller in diameter than the range cable because this is 30 amp to 40. The dry, a stove will be 30 amp, 50, no, 50 amp to 40. I say 30 amp. Um, so the, the stove, the dryer we have here is a four wire cord. I didn't see a cord, a four wire in the drawer, so I, I couldn't bring it here. But when, if you look how long these are, sometimes your meter leads aren't long enough to get all the way in there to check the voltage. So what you do is while it's plugged into the wall, you're gonna take and back the plug off just a little bit from the wall. And now you can touch the prongs of the power cord instead of trying to get your meter lead in there and say do I have proper voltage yeah. so you're going to check these two for 240 and you're going to check 120 and 120 so the first test that was made to the dryer was the power coming in and we had we had from here to here we had 120 and we had here to here, we had 120. Actually, I'm gonna take it back. We had 120, and I'll, and I'll do it in, in a different color so it's easier to see. Mm -hmm. We had 120 here, we had 105 here. Mm -hmm. We didn't have 120. Mm -hmm. Now 105 is enough to get the motor to go. All right, but it is odd that you have 120. In in electrical system, everything likes to be balanced. If you're checking a power supply and one side's giving you 120, the other side should give you 120. But the fact that you're getting a voltage reading, you assume, okay, I got power, but the, the dryer's not running. If you're low on voltage and you put it to a motor, what would happen? Motor won't be strong. Or it might not run at all. If it don't run, what would happen? <coughs> It'd probably hum. Yeah. Yeah. Like you press start and the motor just goes, mm, like it's not going. Okay? But let's, let's go further. Okay, so um, the person that called me said, hey, this, this dryer's not working. And I said, oh, okay, well, did you check the timer switch here? The switch in the timer here. Oh, I changed the timer. Put a brand new timer in there. Did you check the timer? Okay. But anyways, change the timer. So that switch has to be good. Right? I said, what about the door switch? Oh, I changed the door switch. Right now, what does that tell you? If someone's changing Shotgun. on his parts. Shotgun approach. He's still Just stuck. <laughs> And, 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 and it's not a knock on that person. I'm not going to throw any names out, whatever. But the point is, is that, you know, 
you have to check. You have to check. You have to check. If it's your business, your company, and you go to someone's house, and you just start putting parts in, you can't take them back to the parts department. They, they won't take the part back. And a lot of times, if a customer saw you put that part in and saw the machine still not working, they're going to say, I'm not paying for that. That didn't fix my machine. So it, it, it's coming out of your pocket. So you have to be more frugal with your troubleshooting. OK, so anyways, we have voltage to the machine. But I want to know if voltage gained the motor because they said the motor was not humming. It's because it's dead. Okay. okay. So where would you take what where would you test after they already told you to change the timer? Where would you put your meter to start troubleshooting this machine? On the motor. Normally we would go straight to the motor because whenever you have a problem like with a load, like the motor's the load, the part that uses the electricity, you want to go right to the motor and do I have power? If I don't have power to the motor, the motor's bad. Okay? But on a GE dryer, you have to take the top off, you take the front off, you have to take the drum off, and then you can get down to the motor. But can we get close enough see we can let me um i don't know how to insert a slide on this one they, they changed the software on this thing but if we had a diagram that had all these switches let's say a switch here or whatever we had all these switches here any of them could be at fault but what you would want to do is you want to get as close to the motor electrically and at least see if you have voltage that far down because with that test, you can eliminate half of the diagram so you're not testing all of the parts at a time. Because I was discussing one of you here is that they were ohming parts out. Well, wait till you see the next problem on the next stove that we're gonna talk about and you tell me how ohming that out is going to help you, okay? Um, but anyways, if this switch and this switch are up in the control panel, and this one is not, but this one is up in the control panel, then I would put my meter here and, and possibly here, at least see if I got power up to these two points, okay? If I have voltage at that point, then I know this switch is good, this switch is good, and this switch is good. So one voltage test can eliminate multiple parts in the circuit. Now, how many parts could possibly be wrong in my diagram? Looking at that diagram, how many parts could be wrong? Only two, the motor or that switch, okay? So by using voltage, what I explained, explained before is we're not checking one part, we're checking the circuit, okay? So let's continue with this dryer now. All right, so where would be like the easiest place to access to make some voltage tests where we can cut the diagram in half? Star switch, yeah. Where? Star switch is one. Where on the start switch? At the red, that red uh, line. After the start switch. Yeah, after the start switch. Okay, well, I went to brown first, because you don't even have to press the start button there, because line one oh, should, should be all the way to here. I meant to draw instead of erase, but line one should be all the way to here one point. as soon as you turn the timer. Okay, so where would you put your other meter lead? Behind the timer. Where? Behind the timer. What do you mean behind the timer? Behind the switch. No, Give me a specific point. I can't see how that one <laughs> Well, that doesn't help. Would see. it be behind the switch? No, behind what switch? The switch that you, the, you went all the way up to that point. Well, no, we wouldn't put them both here because I want to know if I'm getting power to the motor, and both of them are on one side of the motor. They're on the line one side. The, so the, the other meter lead has to be somewhere there. 
Yeah, the door switch, but that required me to take more panels off, right? Yeah. I'm already where? Where am I when I'm checking the start switch? Where am I physically at? On the top panel. I'm up in the control panel of the machine, okay? The Is there another point in the control oh, the, panel the, the that terminal? I can put my meter? What? Terminal? What do you mean terminal? The terminal block. Right the there. power cord? Yeah, but that's all the way down on the bottom, and now I got to check so something on the... the I don't understand what you're saying. I'm sorry. Um, but the control panel, I'm, I'm back here where the timer and the start switch and everything is on the drive. Well, if you look, this is the timer. If you look here, what is this? Timer. Well. Timer. And if you look at TX, where does it go? TX on the timer goes right back to neutral. So, so neutral that has neutral all the time. There's no switch there. The machine's plugged in at this point and at that point, if the machine's plugged in and I turn the timer dial, I should have 120 volts here. Okay. So the answer was I have 105 volts, right? So is that a good reading? I'm not getting the 120, so what is the next test? Do you trace your steps? What? Do you uh, retrace your steps, go backwards at this point if you're still not getting 105? No. Well, we already checked in the wall. We had 105 at one of the prongs on the wall. Mm -hmm. But what if we did this? If I had 105, but I have 120 here, does it seem like line one might be my problem? But what if we used, what is that? Ground. So if I leave it on this one here and go to a ground screw or something on the machine, I can check for voltage. Now, I don't always like to use line one and ground because it's not a good test. When you have a 240 volt circuit and you use ground, line one can come all the way back around and give you a read. It's not good to use 240 and check one to ground and one to the machine, okay? But we tested the ground anyway. So we put a meter lead here and we had a meter lead here. You know what my reading was? 120. Now the problem is not the machine. The problem is the voltage coming into the machine. The neutral here, either the power cord, which was this gray cord that I showed you. Neutral is bad, but wait, when I checked here, I only had on five here. So the problem is not the cord. The problem is the customer needs electrician to fix the outlet. Mm -hmm. So we had to prove or test that the machine would still run and function. And this was a four wire cord, a four wire cord versus this one. This one only has three terminals. So one goes to L2, one goes to L1, and one goes to neutral. But on the old style three wire cords, ground and neutral are connected together. If you ever look in the back of a stove, you'll see a connection from neutral right to the frame of the machine. On a dryer, when you connect this to a dryer, you'll see a white wire go here or a green wire and connect to the frame of the machine. And the reason they do that is back in the day, they only had three wires and they used neutral to protect the machine. So if something touched the machine, the neutral would carry the voltage away. 
But the problem was if neutral broke on the cord, mm -hmm. there's a potential to have voltage at the cabinet. So I told that person, you have a jumper wire? He said, yeah. I said, do me a favor, jump this, because when you put a four wire, you disconnect neutral and ground. You have four wires. You have red, black, white, red, and green. Red. So you have red here, normally it's black, red here. Mm -hmm. You have black here, mm -hmm. you have white here, and then green would just go right to here. Mm -hmm. So I said, put a jumper from here to neutral. The machine started right up. It started right up. Does the green one go with the white one? The ground? Yes. It, it, when so you when do you the use the tre cable? The viejo, the old electricity was three wire okay. and neutral and ground a mimo, but now the new law, you must have four wire, mm -hmm. and you must separate neutral and ground. I I explained to you after, but before you only have three wires, mm -hmm. so all the stoves and all the all the, the machines, neutral and ground, are together. And that's why we only have three cables. But people would touch the machine if this was broken. When you touch the machine, you're like, ah, you get electrocuted. So the new law is you have to have four cables. And white and green are now separate. But all I wanted to do was to test if the machine will work by putting a jumper there. There would no be no electric spark or nothing like that. No short circuit. When that person put the jumper on there, dryer started right up. So at that point, you just tell the customer, hey, the problem is the electricity in your wall. But they've already installed two parts on the machine. So if you look here, here is a four wire hookup, black, white, red, and ground. Yes. So normally this and this are connected together when you have three wire. But when you put four wire, you disconnect this connection for the four wire. You separate the ground for safety. Okay, but for testing, we put a jumper there and the dryer ran. Okay, but you have to be able to see the circuit. Oh, by the way, here's the timer and the start switch I wanted to show you, but we didn't go through that that way. But um, you have to be able to see the circuit. You have to be able to know if I asked you, where is this part? You have to say, oh, that part is right here, and it's this cable and this cable. Because if I say I put my meter lead on NO, where are you actually putting your meter lead? On what? The door switch. The door switch, brown and yellow. Because we have a white and another white, we have a brown and yellow there. So not only do you need to know what part it is, the door switch, you also need to know the color of wire that is at that point. Because now you gotta go to the machine and you need to check that point. Do you have any questions on this dryer one? I know it went a little fast, but the stove is gonna be a little bit more complicated. When you guys see that, you'll be like, oh wow. Um, okay, so you tested with the, you go to the ground and the neutral and that's your point there. So well, we didn't, we checked voltage to ground and we had 120, but when we checked it to neutral, we only had 105 and right. it's like, in the panel, in the wall, your circuit breaker panel, neutral and ground are together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're separate strips, but they're both screwed to the machine, they, to the box. Mm -hmm. The difference is, is that neutral is designed to carry the electrical current. Ground is only to be a safety if the current the goes to the machine. But back in the day, 240 volt elements did not have a separate ground. 
Now the new law is you must have a separate ground from neutral in case something happened to the neutral, the ground's there to protect the consumer from getting electrocuted. Yes, sir. Is there really, like, you see how you have two control timers there? Is there a way like on the diagrams that they will let you know like it's the same part? It is the same part. There's only no, no, one, no, yeah, but there's only one timer. Okay, yeah, but let's say like if, if you go in there, you don't know like that that machine just has one timer. Let's say you're just, you're just looking at a machine. No, it's not going to tell you that. Okay. You have to know that there's one timer in there. Um, unless it said timer A and timer B, very rarely would they have two timers in any machine. But um, they separate them not where you would physically find them. They separate them the way the electric current flows through the circuit. So this is where, like when you guys are working on the machines, I want you to have the diagram. I want you to look at those circuits. I want you to, to, to follow those circuits and, and, and find the parts on the machine. So that when you're in a customer's home, you've practiced and a little bit more comfortable with troubleshooting that. Yes, sir. Just to clarify, the fix was to get, or is to get an electrician because yes. improper voltage is going to line one. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you said um, the voltage isn't even home. So what's about that design that I hope 105 won't even start to excite the motor? Well, what was happening is that some other components in, in the diagram, like the timer motor, or something was feeding through through the circuit I don't know what the feedback was so you were getting what they call like like sometimes people call it like a ghost voltage you weren't actually getting 105 volts but you were getting feedback through the circuit from other components so you weren't getting a proper voltage and it'll go all the way back to the power cord because it wasn't going out to neutral it was just on the end of the end of the plug in the wall that that white wire where it connects on the back side of the outlet where you plug in could have been burnt or loose. It could even be bad in the panel in, in the customer's home. We don't know. But, you know, if you don't have the proper voltage, you as a technician, you're done. It's an electrician's job. So if you're not getting the right voltage, it's possibly a feedback or something. There are times where I've had people, let's say, put a, let me just clear this. I've had people say, oh, I have 120. And as soon as they press the start button, it drops to 40. So you have voltage and one of the wires could be connected but burnt. But once you draw a load from, you know, draw a current load on that thing, you get a voltage drop on that circuit. And so now your voltage drops. But we didn't do a voltage drop test where we had 105 and as soon as you press start it went to zero or, or to a lower voltage where it wouldn't even make the motor hum. So I don't know what that point was. Remember, I'm helping that person over the phone. So I'm just looking at a diagram say, put your meter here and here, what do you got? Okay, put your meter here, what do you got? Put your meter here and here, what do you got? Okay, do this. And, and so if, if I was there, I might have done it a little bit differently. But when you're telling somebody over the phone how to troubleshoot, you just gotta look at a diagram and figure out how would I do it? Okay, I want you to put your meter at these points and test these points, okay? Any other questions on the jar? No? Okay, so let's take a look at a KitchenAid double wall oven, okay? I got this phone call today from some of my technicians. The upper oven is not working. No bake, no broil. The lower oven, working fine. What does that mean? Yes, sir? A uh, heating issue with the, with the heating circuit? No, the opposite way. Not what the issue is, but what does it tell me if I said the lower oven works? Oh, you got power. I have sufficient power. Because if my lower oven's working, I need 240 volts for my elements. Right. So I'm not worried, do I have proper power to my stove? Okay, or my oven, all right? So I have this entire manual I, I, can, I can share with you guys as well. So here's the wiring diagram. 
upper oven appliance manager, that's the control board for the upper oven, lower oven appliance manager. Okay? Where do I look for to begin my troubleshooting? What did I say is not working? The oven. The oven. Yeah. Okay, but specifically, I said the oven's not working. Let's just pick one thing out. So this is not working. What load in the machine is not working? Broil. The broil or the bake, right? The bake, yeah. So right here, if we got broil, bake, convection, those are my heating elements, right? So let's go ahead and identify the circuit for, I'm gonna do the bake element, but we, we'll, no, we'll do, we'll do the broil element. So here is the circuit that goes through the element. We got, um, let me just follow this wire back. We got line one comes in here, goes to this point, runs up here, and goes to my control board on pin one right there. Okay, now I'm gonna do the other side of the broil element. The other side of the broil element is through line two, comes in here, goes through this circuit like this, comes up and goes to here. What are these right there? What are they? Relays. Relays, what's a relay? I know what it does. <laughs> a relay is a magnetic switch. When power is given to one of these here, these are relays here. This is from a, 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 an oven. When power is given to the back side of the relay, not these two pins here, but to the back side of the relay, there's a little coil of wire. So what we're not seeing is right here on the board, there'd be a little coil of wire that is connected directly to the board. This switch will be like where these two wires are connected on this board, okay? So when the board wants to turn something on, it sends power to that coil, it becomes magnetic, and it closes this switch on the board, okay? So let me just erase some of this to clear it up. Where do we begin testing? We press start, and, but we said the broil don't work, the bank don't work, the convection is not working. Now, before you s s say something, let me, let me add one more thing. If you only have one thing in an appliance that's not working, a drain pump on a dishwasher, a water valve on a washing machine, you have hot water, no cold water, a, um, a wash motor, in a washer that has a separate drain pump, the drain pump will drain water, so it'll fill the water and drain out, but it won't wash. Then you just go to that component and look for the circuit for that one component. But in this case, how many components do I have there? Three. I have three. And all three of them are not working. So before we start troubleshooting one complete circuit, what we try to do is we try to say, what one part in the machine, if it failed, would stop all of them from working? Control board would be one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're pointing at. Do you guys know what he's pointing at? Yes, sir? The thermal fuse? Yeah. The thermal limiter, right? That's a fuse. Yeah, it's a fuse. If that fuse was bad, if you look, line two has to go through that fuse for the board before it goes to any of those elements. So it's either the board or the fuse, right? So what test and where would I test to begin troubleshooting? Where would my first test be? Check it to the zone, so you would, you would check from the, the line feeding. Well, let, let me tell you before you even say that. This is a wall oven, and that fuse is on the back of that oven. Mm -hmm. These control boards are right on the top, or you could pull the oven out a little bit and get right to those boards. Mm -hmm. All right? 
actually, I drew the diagram. I sort of like, my drawing basically tells you where you're going to make your first test. Look at my yellow yeah, lines and tell me where would you make your first test. Pin one and pin one. I, I can't, can't see them. from here, so I won't know what the pin okay. are. So I tell you what I'll do. Watch this. Forget about these line one, line two. I'm going to zoom in on a diagram so y'all can see it better, okay? <laughs> All you blind people. Better bring your binoculars next time, okay? So, so let me bring my yellow line back. So, so wait, wait, let, let's do this. So we're going to go here. And my line one's coming into this pin, and my line two's coming here to this pin. Right, so, you check those. so those two pins are gonna be where I'm gonna check and how much voltage am I looking to check at those two points? 240. 240. So you put your meter here, and you put your meter here, 33 volts. Mm. It's bad. What's bad? The uh, temperature limit. Well, you're going a little too fast. <laughs> we haven't tested it yet, have we? I mean, that's the only thing in the circuit, right? Yeah. Okay. But what if I had a problem with this circuit coming up here? I don't know yet. Now, normally, like I said, I don't like to check from line one to ground or neutral or line two to ground on a 240 volt circuit. But in this, it's okay because I have a, a relay here and a relay here that separate them. So they're, they're their own circuit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from here to ground and I'm going to look for how much voltage. 120. 120. So they made a test from here to ground, 120. That was good, right? Now, by the way, they changed this board. I didn't give you all the information. I'm holding back some stuff, okay? They changed the board. So they went from here, pin one, to ground, and they had 33 volts. I don't, I don't even know if they had any volts. I think they had zero volts at that time. I think the 33 volts because something was feeding back. They had zero volts. Let's say zero, okay? Let's just say from here to ground, they had a meter here and here, zero volts. So it looks like that thermal limiter is bad, right? Yep. But we're not going to just change it. We're going to test. So if you were telling somebody to test, what are you going to tell them to do? Jump it. Jump it. Okay. But we're already, we already got our meter in our hand, right? And we got to get to it. So we're now we got to pull the oven out. Remember, I didn't have a proper voltage at the first time, right? So I'm going to check red to ground. Zero volts. So that means if that fuse is bad, the voltage can't get to it. So what do we do? We go from here to ground. Zero volts. And by the way, again, I held some information back. They changed both those parts, and the yeah, oven so did not work. So what do we do now? Check the line. Check what line? Can you be more specific? Uh, like, if you're telling me on the phone, check the uh, line. Check, check Tell me, the, where, where do I got to check it? I don't know where check to check it. Check out to uh, the power. I mean, at, at the power, at the, at the terminal. I will check out the terminal block. What do you mean, check L2 at the terminal block? Um, check, check L2 to ground. But the other oven's working, so L1, L2, and neutral are good. Oh shit, that's right, I forgot you said that. <laughs> yeah, so you, hey, did you need a power to Yeah, um, okay. So I have proper power. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna unplug the machine, and we're gonna check this wire to line two on a power cord for continuity. Because all we have from this point back to the power cord wire. is a wire. Now let's take a minute and let's go back through the steps. Our first test was on K11 relay, one side, which is the blue wire. And then we have K3, which is red, because this is red and white here, right? Mm -hmm. So let's take a look 
at our relay. This is our board. Over here, this is one of our relays, the red, and we're gonna be on the red wire here. And down here is our blue and black and white. Black is line two. They didn't, the diagram and the machine don't match, but that is the diagram, okay? So we checked both black and blue to ground. We had power on one of them. I don't remember which one. Let's just say the black one. And when we checked from here to here, I did not have the 240. Okay? So then they went to that little thermal limiter. And we went from one terminal to ground, zero volts. Other terminal to ground, zero volts. All right? Notice this machine don't have a green ground. Oh, there it is right there. Now, this is not that exact diagram. I took a picture of our stove, our oven here, because I didn't have a good picture of, of the power cord. But that's how it is. These wires are the power coming in, and these wires are the machine coming out. But when we're saying go to the terminal block, that's what we're talking about. We have sufficient power here, and this is right on top of the stove, right next to the computer board. So you could do your voltage right there. So I told them that you need to go from one of these wires here and go to this wire here with the machine unplugged and check resistance, continuity, and see if this red wire came all the way back here. The only problem is, is they're both red wires, and I don't know which one is the one that goes here because the other one goes where? To the computer board. So if you don't get a reading on this one and this one, move your meter over to this one and this one and check it. And guess what? They didn't get a reading. So what does that mean? That means the, wires, yeah, that means the red wires broke. Mm -hmm. Real quick, this thermostat's here. The board and the power cord are on the top. So all these wires running here are going up through that bundle of wires. So it was very hard for them to try to follow the wire. I said, listen, you guys need to check the wire. So, look what they found. That wire that I just showed you, that bundle of wire, didn't I say you all say, oh wow? <laughs> that, that runs up through right there, that channel. So, this is a close up, I'm sorry, went the wrong way. This is a close up of that channel just turned sideways. And this wire was right here. The customer had the oven in self-clean. Self-clean is about a thousand degrees, 850 to a thousand degrees. So it causes the insulation around them wires to get a little bit hot. So it makes it easier for that wire to get cut right there on the power cord. These are both uh, the same part, but there was two technicians and each one took a picture and sent me, but this one was a better picture than that one. Uh, you really couldn't see the wires too well. But if we looked at this one closely, look a little more. Look at the black wire there too. That black wire is close too. And they found the edges too to, to prevent stuff like that. Like the yeah, but where was it? Where was that wire right at? It was right where it wasn't rolled over. That whole harness was pulled over and that metal and that wire was probably so close tolerance that it just took a period of time, every time they open and close the door or something, that wire just moved and cut through the insulation on the wire. Okay, so what I told them to do is fix the wire, you know, cut it, wire nut it, tape it up. But I said, pull the harness up some so that this part, I'm sorry, so that this part of the, of, of the harness was here so that you had more protection of the wire at that point. I said, at this wire, which is the, the top, run some electrical tape around it to make it bigger so that it wouldn't pull back down through. Try to secure it so it doesn't get to where the wire can touch that you have extra prote protection. But that's a problem today. But let's go back to this diagram for a second. When we 
look at this diagram, we said there's only two things that would stop all of these elements from working. It was the board or that fuse. And when they called me, they had already changed the board and the fuse. And then they said, oh man, we don't know what to do now. Well, where do you have the voltage? Where is the electricity? Because the voltage is what makes our part work. So you need to put your meter and find out how far did voltage get? And that's how we found the broken wire, but they should have been able to do that. They just weren't looking at the, they sent me a picture of the diagram. I went online and downloaded the good clean one because I couldn't read it on my phone. But the point is, is that you need to know how to read the diagram. You need to know how to do voltage safely. If you are not comfortable and been doing it for a long time because the problem is actually the people that have been doing it a long time are the ones that get hurt the most. Okay? It's either the ones that are just, or the ones that are just so dumb they know what they're doing. I've had people get a power cord like this for a dryer. I said, oh yeah, you got to connect this to the dryer. The dryer don't work. So they plug it into the wall and they're holding on to it like this. So now the, all these wires got like, just, wait. Oh my you know, so you have to be careful. When I'm talking about voltage, I'm trying to talk to people who are familiar with using a meter. If you are not comfortable with your hands, use safety gloves, unplug the machine, set your meter with alligator clips on those points that you want to make a test, then plug the machine in. Your hands are not there. You're not going to get electrocuted. Okay? Don't be in there, especially in some of these wall ovens. There's so many wires. Sometimes you're so into like this board. Oh, I got I got to check this point and this point on the board and you're not paying attention to what's in front of it and you're resting your arm down on a live wire. I've seen that. I've had a student working on a microwave. I can still remember the student. And I'm talking over 25 years ago. The guy's working on a microwave says it's not heating. I said, "Go to the transformer and see if you got 120 volts." He comes back to me and says, "Yeah, Richard, I checked. I don't have 120 volts." I said, "You don't?" Let me go look. So he's got the transformer there, and the two wires are in the air, and he's got the meter leads on the transformer. Well, where's the voltage coming from? The wires. He disconnected. He was thinking resistance or ohms test where we disconnect the wires, not voltage test. So you guys need to understand. So when you guys are doing voltage tests for the first time, and the second and the third, call me so we can make sure that it's done safely and properly. But that was just nothing more than a broken wire. But they spent extra time in a customer's home, installed parts that needed, didn't need to be stopped. Because I understand they ordered it before they went out because they went, one guy went out and he couldn't pull the oven up to get to that thermostat in the back and test it. He looked at the diagram and said, well, these are the only two things I can see in that diagram that would stop all three of them from working. So I understand why he ordered them. But once you open the box and put the part on, it's no good. So now you got the second man, take two minutes and test it. Because they installed two good parts that didn't need to be installed. It was a broken wire. Anybody got any questions on this? No? Okay, we're gonna do a little bit more schematic troubleshooting until I get a camera for this washer diagnostics and troubleshooting second. I wanna make sure that those videos are a little bit better quality. Um, but you have to understand the circuit, you have to understand the diagram, and you have to know how to use your meter. Know when you can do voltage, where to do voltage, unplug the machine, put your meter lead, plug the machine in, keep your hands away. Just look at your meter. You don't need to hold on to it, okay? Guys that hold on to it, they're, you know, they're daredevils. Don't call me a daredevil, but. Mm -hmm. But I know what I'm doing. I could have, I could have probably found that problem in five minutes in the customer's home. I would have, boom, boom, boom. Okay, that's the problem right there. I might not have seen that blown wire right away, but I would have known that wire was the problem in less than five minutes once I got the oven out. You have to know what this diagram is. And if I point to you and say, okay, you see this point right here? 
Show me where it is on the machine, that exact point, that exact wire, because that's where you gotta put your meter. You have to be able to take that diagram and put it to the machine and know what point on that machine you are actually testing. Because you may have how many red wires? One, you know, you have red wire here, and then I can go and find a bunch of other red wires. If you're just looking for a red wire, you're checking the wrong red wire, you're gonna make more mistakes and you're gonna do good. So take your time. Yes. Yes, sir. Logically, if, the, if, if one oven is working, right? So you know you have power coming into the thing. Mm -hmm. what, ex what explanation did they give you for changing parts? Because it would say, you would say, if I have power to one section, do I have power to the second section? Which should be the first test, right? Well, so why would they, why, what was their rationale? How, what was their thinking that we can learn from? Well, I, I, like I said, let me, let me just make it a little bit smaller then so we can see the whole diagram. So you guys can't read it again. Yeah, it's such a big diagram. Okay, so yeah, this this oven here is working, but that oven is not. But the red and black, you got a black here going in. Well, here, the red and black for that oven are two different red and blacks. They're not the same red and black. They both go back to the power cord. They they all go back to this. You see, I got two reds. And I got multiple blacks there. Mm -hmm. So well, uh, on their machine, and their rationale was when they first went to the customer's home, they couldn't get it out to, to test it and, and determine what the actual fault was. Okay. But I can tell you right now, a lot of my technicians are lazy. They go in and they look and say, oh, it's, it's got to be this. I've seen it a hundred times. <laughs> and then they go and they go to the customer's house and they put it in. And it's not the right part. I learned a long time ago, back in the 80s, when I was working for Sears, that there was a lot of technicians back then that didn't know how to read schematics. Guys that had 30, 40 years. But back then, you know, it was old school. We didn't have computers. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have all the technology we have today. So you were taught by another technician in the field or whatever, or you were taught in some classroom or some book, but you didn't really... Uh, not very few people went to a school like like I did or like you guys are doing. So the thing was is that people are lazy and they just look at the diagram and the rationale was, well, if all three of them not working, the only things, the only parts that would fail would be the fuse and the board. The problem is, is they didn't take the time when they came back with the parts and had the machine out where they could test it to determine if it was the fuse or the board. They just went ahead and started changing the part. And then the problem was, is it didn't fix the problem, and they called me and said, hey, help, I can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So the problem is lazy. That they didn't bother. When I was in, going back to what I said, when I was back learning in, in the 80s, I, I get parts that another technician would order, and I wouldn't just install it in a customer's machine. I'd start testing with me. You know, I've had customers tell me, uh, why aren't you installing the part? I said, ma'am, I just want to confirm that this is the problem. Because I don't want to install the part and spend 20, 30 minutes changing the part and the machine's not fixed and guess what? I got to diagnose it again. It doesn't take that long to diagnose. I tell my technicians, it should take you 15 minutes or less to troubleshoot almost any problem. Now, does that mean every time you troubleshoot a machine it's going to be 15 minutes? No, it's not. So you have to be in a time frame. Technicians run eight, 10 calls a day. I was back in the 80s or 90s, late 80s, 90s, working for Brandsmark. I was running 15 service calls a day, but I was still finishing at two or three o'clock in the afternoon. I lived down in Kendall, had to drive all the way up to the Brandsmark here in North Miami. My service area was Southwest 8th Street to Homestead. So I had to drive in rush hour traffic, come here, and then drive back down there and run 15 calls. And I still finish at two or three o'clock in the afternoon because I knew how circuits work and I knew diagrams work. So it only took me a couple of tests to tell what the problem was. And I knew if the part I had was gonna fix it or, or if I needed to order a specific part. But that's why you guys are here to learn to do this. 
And when you are working on these machines, it's not just take the machine apart, put the machine back together. All you're learning is how to change parts. Okay, you're a good parts changer. You're not a technician. This refrigerator that one of my techs went out today, they were out there the other day. Said the freezer's cooling, but the refrigerator's not. Well, there's a little damper that lets air. I says, is the fan running? Oh yeah, the fan's running. Is the damper good? Well, we felt some air in there, so the air was coming into the refrigerator compartment. I said, did you look at the evaporator? No, no, it's a monogram. It was way up in there, we couldn't see it. Did you test the defrost cycle? Well, no, I wasn't the lead technician, so I'm not going to tell them what to do. I'm there as a helper. I haven't been with the company that long, okay? But that person was able to say, no, man, we, we haven't properly tested this machine out. And guess what? I didn't get a phone call from the house. Well, yes, I did. I, I will apologize. They did call me and I sent them the service manual. They didn't ask me to help them troubleshoot it, but I had to run into a faculty meeting and I wasn't able to actually be available for them. But we do have GE technical support, but yet his phone wasn't working and there was all other issues. But the point is, is that technician has experience, a lot of experience. He's actually a good tech. He's lazy. I'm not going to get on his case because him and I talk, and I don't want to put his name out there on blast on the, on the camera, but him and I talk. He says, man, I don't want to, I said, I already know. I already know who's the lazy ones and who's the good ones. Mm -hmm. I could point out to a handful of guys that are good ones. Those guys are on commission making seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year working for me. But they know what they're doing. They know to check with a meter. They don't just walk up and order a part and say, oh, it's still not fixed. Because they don't want to go back a second time. If you're on commission, you don't get paid till the job is done. So if you go to someone's house and order a part, you want to make sure that's the right part. Because when you go back, you don't want to put that part in and say, oh, that's not the right part and then order another part and go back. You wanna make sure you have the right part the next time so you're done, you got your money, you're, you're good. And if you own your own business, it's the same thing. Commission and owning your own business is almost the same thing. The more jobs you complete a day, the more money you make. If you have to keep ordering parts and going that back a second time, you go to one house twice, your time is money. Okay, so you can't keep driving to a house three or four times, you've already wasted enough gas and enough man time or hour time, working time, that you're losing money. If you have to go three or four times to do a job, you've lost money on the job. You don't think about it, but that day you're going to a house three or four times, you could have been going to another house, doing another job, making you more money. So you have to be accurate in your diagnosis. Do I make mistakes? Yes. Do I order a wrong part once in a while? Yes, not lately because I don't do that anymore. Okay, but I've been there. I've gone and misdiagnosed, but I've learned not to go behind somebody else and, and, and see that I got a part to install and it's not, not the right part. I learned, no, I'm gonna check that machine and prove that that part is wrong before I install that part. It only takes an extra two minutes to put a meter if, if I said this board was bad, I'm going to check one or two things on this board to say, yeah, right, that board's bad. Before I install it, if someone else ordered it. Now, if I ordered it, I hope I did good. Any questions? No? Okay, so you know next week I'll be in Orlando or Vegas at PSA doing some training and maybe get some updated training. I'll try to bring back some new technical information and stuff for y'all. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we will do more of this the week I get back, okay? Because I see a lot of people asking questions about diagrams. I will give you guys, when I come back, some diagram handouts that you're gonna use for troubleshooting. I'm gonna give you test points. I say, I got voltage here, I got voltage here. I don't have voltage here, but I don't have voltage here. What's wrong with the machine? Mm -hmm. So almost like as if you did the voltage tests and you got voltage to different points, what is wrong with that machine? Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. All right, since you don't have any questions, go back to your shop work.